Daredevils, thrill seekers, adrenaline junkies. They are a, a rare breed who not only defy danger but appear to relish it. So what drives them to push themselves to the extreme and is the experience worth risking your life? Chunking yourself off a cliff, jumping out of a plane, well, it sounds mad to a lot of us, but for others, it's the ultimate thrill. Extreme sports, such as base jumping, are on the rise, but so are the number of accidents and deaths. So what motivates people to put themselves in such danger? From base jumping to mountain climbing, extreme sports are pushing minds and bodies to the limit. But is it reckless behaviour or highly skilled thrills? Those who actually do it say it's the ultimate way to live. Free climbers like Alan Robert, dubbed the French Spider-Man, has scaled hundreds of skyscrapers without any safety equipment. But if pushed too far, it can also end in death. 2016 was the deadliest year for base jumping, with over 30 people losing their lives to the sport. What drives people to take that leap of faith? Right, let's get talking about the thrills, the spills. Joining us from Bali, we have Alain Robert, the man they call the French Spider-Man. We move to Brisbane next in Australia. Eric Brimer, a professor of adventure sports from Leeds Beckett's University. And at the round table with me, Martin Harris, director of the Skydive Centre and Rupert Court, the British indoor and outdoor snowboard speed record holder. I am surrounded by so much adrenaline, I don't really know where to start, but we will go to you Alain in Bali, because you're so well known for this. And yet, you had a fear of heights. Well, yeah, it used to be like that, you know, when... Uh, before I even started to climb, when I was like uh, eight years old. And then finally, by the age of 11, I have climbed my parents' building. I was not having my keys, I was having to go back home. My parents were living on the seventh floor, and I have decided that I was going to make it. And did that cure you <laughs> immediately, or was it something that took a few years to, to get around? You just knew you could do it. Were you still scared? Well, actually, when I was doing it, uh, I, I didn't really think uh, much about whether I was fr afraid or not. It was just like it became uh, spontaneous. Like, for example, before an ascent, like uh, three weeks ago, I cannot tell you that I am not afraid because uh, deep down I am. I just know that once I'm going to start to do the ascent, I'm going to be uh, completely uh, focused. And then I am going to forget about everything except climbing. But why do it without any assistance, Alain, unless you wanted to, to have the ultimate thrill, the, the, the fear of perhaps dying? Because you have no ropes, you have no harnesses, you have no, no, nothing fixing you to the building. It's just your hands and uh, your, your feet. Why do it that way? This is what is uh, interesting for me. For example, I told many times to the journalist that if I was having some uh, wings, I wouldn't climb because I'm not really interested in sports. I am interested in doing something uh, that is requiring um, a little bit of, um, let's say, a little madness. But most of all, there is that desire to achieve something. So it's like floating in between uh, life and death. But there again, I'm always trying to work on uh, calculated risk. Uh, I've been training for decades and decades, so this is pretty much my whole life, and actually I'm still alive. Yeah, the last one you're talking about was the one in the City of London, I think it was Heron House, and of course you, you normally get arrested for these things, but we'll get into that a little bit later on, and then obviously release. But let me ask you two here in the studio, before we go to Eric, because Eric's going to sort of cast his opinions on this, having, having done the study. Is there a fear element to this that makes it fun? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, it's a bit like uh, Alan said, it's kind of calculated risk. So there is a bit of bit of risk in, in it, which kind of makes makes you kind of get that that, that fear, that kind of adrenaline at the, at the beginning. But obviously it always, it's always like a build-up, so you don't kind of... He started with seven stories and then went 
up to however many stories he's done, crazy heights. Um, and obviously the same with kind of when I go snowboarding, if you start off gently on a green run and then you work your way up and each time you kind of, when you've learnt on a green run, you go to a blue and then a red and then a black and then mm. you kind of find a black's not that steep anymore and you don't find but, something But the, da the danger here is that it's a little bit like taking a, a, a hard drug, isn't it? It's, you know, the first time it gives you a buzz, but then you have to have more and then you have to have more and then you have to have more until eventually you can't take any more. Now, in your sport, there's going to come a point where you think going 150 miles an hour or 150 kilometres an hour is, is boring and you're going to push it further and further until that's the end of you. Well, I hope not. <laughs> well, obviously, there is that, that you can. Obviously, you're always going to try and push yourself a little bit further. But um, obviously, if you, like, don't, with mine, if you were saying winning, if you, like, don't manage to get out there over, over summer, so then I kind of go and do, do other sports. So that's kind of where we do, like, kite surfing. So then, then we go back to snow winning. Obviously, it's kind of a little bit of a, a difference in it again. So you kind of jump but between do you, sports. Do you get what I'm saying? Is that the, yes, the, just, the thrill will become less each time if it becomes yes. normal and therefore you're going to have to push yourself to ridiculous. You do kind extremes. of, yeah, just keep pushing yourself further each time because you'll just kind of do something that originally felt like a big thrill and that gave you that adrenaline rush and then afterwards you kind of do that a few times to the point that then you can do that and you're actually quite in control going at that speed. You think, oh, go a little bit faster, okay. go a little bit faster. You, you did your last jump. Uh, Saturday. Just Saturday of this week, mm. but you take lots of people who've never done any. Every weekend. Why do you think they do it? A lot of people do it because they have a cause to do it for. A lot of people do it just for getting it off of the bucket list. And it doesn't matter whether you're 16 or 90. You have just as much fun. We've had 92-year-old brothers, twin brothers do it, and the grins on their faces the moment they left the plane were phenomenal and they were still jumping up and down when they landed 92 years old and jumping up and down okay so so what about the um the other side of it that it, it, it to do something as extreme as, as you do and you do and ally you do is, is quite selfish because there are other people out there who, who are worried about you the whole time my wife skydived i've got a seven-year-old son i Have don't push him out of a plane yet He's too young, unfortunately, but he comes with us every weekend and he cannot wait. He <laughs> loves the wind tunnel. <laughs> OK. Uh, Eric, you did a study about this. Um, first of all, tell me, because it was a surprise conclusion and it was something to do with the fact that these were not people who were necessarily uh, had a death wish. Um, but, but what do you make of what you've heard? Uh, I think what um, I'm hearing at the moment is, is quite typical, really, um, for at least with regards to the people that I've spoken to. My study, well, the initial study, because we've done quite a few since the initial one, was really about the most extreme, uh, extreme sports. Um, at that time, it was things like base jumping um, and uh, big wave surfing, uh, climbing without ropes, um, and so forth. Um, and what we found very much was um, that we're looking at people who have a, a, a profound understanding of the environment that they're working in a profound understanding of the activity that they're undertaking. And of course, they need to have a really good understanding of themselves and their own capabilities and capacities. Because in the end, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff and you're about to jump off, if you're a base jump, you don't really understand what you're capable of, or you haven't read the environment very well, then the ultimate outcome is death. Um, so the knowledge is really, really important. So what we find is rather than people who are desperate to take thrills and, and so forth, is we find people who are um, after an experience that is, uh, can't get in any other way or in any other aspect of life. Many people talk about in terms of, uh, that it's very similar to mindfulness, very similar to that kind of experience that is uh, beyond the everyday. And in fact, one of the most um, unique things we found, the things we least expected, was this real deep connection with the natural world and an aspect of the experience that people had no words for, which is part of the challenge when you try to talk about these experiences to people who haven't had the experiences, that the real essence of it is something that cannot be put into words. Alain, do you recognise yourself in the description that Eric has just given? I think, yeah, quite well, because... Uh... You know, there again, uh, climbing, uh, free soloing, I, I really put my life uh, at stake. But most of all, there is absolutely uh, no desire to fall, uh, no desire to die. And, you know, if I was uh, a suicidal uh, person, 
it seems that uh, it has already taken quite a long time since I've been climbing now for 44 years. So uh, it's pretty much uh, a lifetime. Like in France, people, uh, they are supposed to work for years. So it's more about, you know, knowing yourself, knowing what you are capable of and doing it. I'm training. I, I am checking on buildings, uh, prior to the ascent and everything. But knowing what you're capable of, or what you think you are capable of, and encountering obstacles along the way are, are two different things. You don't really know what's coming up, do you? Because you can't climb the building in the first place to check it's safe because you're not supposed to do it. Exactly. Well, it's like um, you are calling it uh, climbing uh, on site. It means that step by step uh, you are discovering uh, the building or you are discovering the cliff and uh, deep down you think that you're gonna make it or at least uh, you're gonna find a way whether you're having to cross on the left or on the right or maybe just uh, climbing down because you are stuck and you you can't make it well what's going through your mind other than the technicalities and i must do this next, I must do that next. Is it a, a sense of time slowing down, of all your senses being that much more heightened? Yeah, well, if, for example, uh, I am encountering uh, some very hard difficulties, I am really having the feeling that the, the, the time is just uh, suspended. Like a uh, few seconds may seem that it takes like uh, an eternity, but um, on the contrary, when everything is okay, uh, actually I enjoy it. It can be uh, quite fast, you know. As when I was climbing in London, I could hear the people uh, cheering me up. So sometimes, yes, I was having to slow down because uh, I was uh, encountering uh, obstacles, but sometimes that was better. And then I was also uh, enjoying, enjoying people. Uh, you know, I really could feel that the people uh, on my back and down the building, they were really uh, vibrating, they were really uh, cheering me up. I was pleasing people. Is that, is that something that you two recognize? The, 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 the heightening of your senses, the fact that what only takes three seconds seems to take about 50 or 50 seconds, maybe, maybe a little bit more, uh, because everything slows down, you are in such perfect control of what you're doing. How long does your run take you, the one where you set the indoor record? Uh, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 seconds, I guess. OK, and it, did you notice at that point that you were in total control of your thoughts and you could think clearly and it seemed like you were thinking forever? Yeah, because you kind of... Um, same thing any of the runs, if you're kind of concentrating so hard on each section, so if you're, when you're on a snowboard, kind of riding along, thinking exactly what each edge is doing, how like, aerodynamically you're tucked, why you're doing all that, you might have only gone a couple of metres, but you're coming home to like run through it all and kind of thinking how you can change it and things like that. So, yeah, it, although you are travelling quite quickly, you obviously, uh, yeah, it doesn't feel that fast because you're kind of concentrating on everything so much and, and kind of trying to, trying to notice every little, little part. Yeah. Um, and what, what about when you're jumping out of a plane? I guess not every time it's gone absolutely <laughs> straightforwardly. Obviously, it hasn't ended <laughs> badly, but uh, there must be times when you think, oh, hang on, I have to deal with this situation now. Does well, time I've just slow taken... down for you then? Yes, I mean, I've just taken up wingsuiting again after about five years off. This is one where you, like, bat? Yes. Uh, put simply, um, last wingsuit exit, I made a complete mess of it. Rolled over onto my back. Start again, absolutely... start again. So, you, you, so you, you, you're flying off a cliff? Nope, jumping out of a plane. Jumping out of a plane in a wingsuit? In a so wingsuit. no parachute? Parachute as well. But that's only just, just in case, is it? It's there to save your life at the end of the skydive. Right, OK. Uh, and then what happened? You, you, got, you flipped yourself over? Basically, I stood on my own foot. And Hard to do in fresh air, isn't back. it? Not exiting the door of a plane. Oh, I see, not. OK. <laughs> Remember, your legs are attached yeah, to each other. Yeah. So you get it wrong, roll onto your back, doing everything I shouldn't. Flat, inverted, spin. And you thought, oh, dear. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Words to that effect. And what did you do? Time does effectively slow down because you go to drills, you go to procedures, you go to everything you've been taught over the course of your entire jumping career. And it's, what do I need to do next? You've got 30 to 50 seconds. Splat. You've got time to deal with it. And 
experience brings you that, I'm sure you'll agree with me, that you, you realise that you, you can use the abilities you've got and the time you've got. Okay. Let's get to Eric. Eric. What is the difference between these three people who all seem to have got it planned as far as they possibly can and yeah. those people who do take unnecessary risks? Well, uh, to, to, I think what, it, what, we're, what we're seeing is the difference um, being related to the preparation, the commitment, um, the skill required, the knowledge required, um, as I said, of themselves, of the environment. Of Alain, is there anything you would consider to be too ridiculous to attempt? Um... I don't actually, I, I don't really know, you know, uh, as far as I know, uh, most of the time, because uh, I am climbing uh, illegally, I am trying to find something that it suits me. Uh, first of all, uh, it has to be quite tall. If not, for me, it seems to be a bit uh, ridiculous. It has to be uh, aesthetic. It has to be uh, difficult or, or very difficult. Uh, I'm not trying, you know, to, to climb something that is too easy because it's it's a bit boring. I, I, I still need to feel that um, I am achieving something and I am having fun because uh, it's difficult, because I feel that I am pretty much uh, on the edge and um, this is also what uh, makes me feel alive. Okay. Um it makes Alan feel alive. These two have said the same sort of thing. But what makes people do idiotic things that, in the end, could cost them their lives, sometimes does cost them their life? What's the yeah. difference? Well, if you, uh, when you say idiotic things, you're talking about those who don't have the commitment, preparation and so forth. Or and, somebody uh, who does a handstand on the top of a tall building ledge. Uh, somebody who sets himself on fire to post it on social media. You know, that sort of stuff. If, if almost showing off. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a different um, experience there. And that's often the challenge, is trying to describe something that is profound uh, as the extreme sports is in terms that people understand which is the sort of hedonistic thrill-seeking notion uh, that you're talking about. Um, there are definitely uh, you know, people who might even get into extreme sports because the original idea is about the thrill and this sensation of risk and the idea of excitement and the, all the heavy rock music that goes through the um, YouTube videos. But, but either they end up dead or they um, uh, and those are, uh, are the ones that have that sort of um, commitment and, and experience that, yeah. profound, is, uh, is that it, profound. Is it because, let's, let's get you two here, is it because yeah. life otherwise is, 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 is so boring these days? Uh, too safe, too no. dull, too predictable. <laughs> 200 years ago, you might have been challenged to a duel. You might have got run over by a horse and cart. You might have died of cholera. I mean, you know, you're doing this because you need to get a thrill. If you try crossing the road outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just going around here is probably more dangerous. Um, so, obviously, yeah, I'm obviously down at the beach and work running a, that kite surfing school. So, for us, it is a bit more like, outdoorsy and doing stuff. And obviously, he has a skydiving school. So... Just what we do, obviously, is a little bit more outside and interesting, but... But imagine if you didn't do this, would you find life boring? I get a little bored in offices. Um, if I just kind of sat there, I just want to go out and do something. Um, so I think it's, it's more like when we found some things that we, we like and kind of keep us interested, and then that's then just progressed forward rather than mm. just because it's rather than, rather than kind of sitting around. Um, but life's become a career. Yes. The simplest way. We we found we yeah. found that being out there doing is what keeps us going. It's what makes me smile of a morning. It's what makes me want to come home to my wife and son. It makes me go out and do it again the next day. It's all about the smiles of other people as well. It's not about us. Because we're at a level now where we're teaching other people. I've got an idea. Why don't we get you to take Alain up in your plane? Put him in a wingsuit <laughs> from 10,000 feet to land on top of, and I won't say the building just in case you do it, and then climb down. Alan, what do you think? Well, sounds good, actually. Uh, I would love doing it, but uh, I, I don't know if you can do it uh, together or, or not. 
Well, I tell you what, OK, that, that's a, that's a <laughs> possibility. <laughs> it's a possibility, yeah, and I will come along it as is. the official recorder of such an event as long as I can stay in the plane. Is that all right? Oh, no, if you get on the plane, you're getting it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting sweaty <laughs> hands already now that you've said that, because it does scare me. I had a, I had a tumble once uh, that put, put me off heights. And I, I wonder if... I mean, Alan was scared of heights. He then overcame it. Eric, Eric do people need to do yep. this to, to validate themselves? Is this what it is to some extent? I'm not sure I'd use the word validate themselves. I think it's more about um, being a human being. Um, in the end, human beings are, have um, always wondered what's around the corner. Um, that's how we move from where we uh, originated from, if you want to follow the evolutionary journey, by wondering what's around the corner. And some people are a little more curious than people, and they look for things that um, might challenge them, look for opportunities and so forth. What will your life mean to you the day you have to, s to stop doing what you do? Alan, first of all. Um, the, the thing is, you know, uh, although I am already uh, 56, at this point of time, I am really not planning uh, to stop climbing. For me, uh, free soloing, uh, it's my life. I have uh, nearly dedicated the last uh, 44 years climbing, uh, climbing some cliffs without any safety, climbing some mountains the same way, and uh, climbing buildings. So, But there, one day, well, one no day you're going to get, um, the bones will be creaking, your eyesight won't be good enough, um, and you're going to have to stop. Will that be the end of your Maybe life, effectively? Be... I'm not sure, because uh, I also, nowadays, uh, I do enjoy uh, giving talks. There is a big uh, corporation uh, companies who are contacting me and uh, they want their, their guys, you know, to learn about uh, calculated risk, but also about uh, being bold, um, you know, the, the kind of things that uh, people need uh, to feel alive and most of all uh, to be uh, performant. Martin, what do, you, what do you think? The day, the day it has to stop. I'm not asking this young man here. <laughs> because he's, he's a lot younger than us at the moment. But, I mean, I, I want to ask you, one day you're going to have to say that's it, aren't you? You can't, I'm teach 54. People when, you can't teach people when you're 90, though, can you? I'm 54. There's a group called SOS, Skydivers Over 70. There's at least 16, 20 years left in me yet. When that time comes, I'll have taught so many people to skydive that I'll be able to enjoy life vicariously through them. OK. So, or will you have to find a, a different way of, you know, if I have to find a different frame way racing. Of, why not? Who's that guy who does all the uh, the motorised um, projects? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember. Where's the a old, tie? The old memory. We know each other. <laughs> we, we've only got about a minute or a couple of minutes to go. Alan, I have serious questions for you. It's been great fun having having you on the program, but what what about this one? Um, if anybody copied what you do and hurt themselves or, God forbid, lost their lives, would you feel in any way responsible? Well, it's kind of complicated. It's a little bit like, let's take something more general about people racing a car as a professional and guy just having his driving license and who is maybe killing himself but also killing somebody else. So, deep down, you know, if some people, uh, they are trying to uh, imitate uh, what I do, I guess they need to think twice. They need to be uh, prepared physically and mentally, and maybe uh, they may be able to do it. But there again, I, I don't think I will feel uh, responsible if somebody who is trying to climb a building is falling and uh, dying. And will you decide to stop the day that you stand at the bottom of the building and think, I'm scared? That could be, but um, at this very moment, uh, on the contrary, uh, when I climb something uh, my own way, it makes me feel alive. So, And what you are telling me is pretty much uh, the other way around. So, so far and until now, I enjoy, I need to get my kind of fix a few times a year. 
and I hope that I can still do it maybe until the age of 70 or, or even more than that. 70 is the new 35. That's fantastic. Alan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, when you come to London next, do look us up. Um, and if you two get together on any kind of project in the future, please let me know. I will come along. I promise you I won't jump out of the plane. But you're still going to need somebody there. You're more than welcome. As, as a professional witness. Listen, thank you very much indeed. Alan, where are you going next, by the way? Or can't you tell us? I can't tell you. Well, I will be doing something in France uh, in uh, March, but about the other destination, uh, I can't tell you. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Thank you very much indeed. Alan Robert, thank you, Eric. Uh, from Brisbane. We appreciate the fact that you both came in. Good luck with your careers. Uh, and long may you continue to, to find thrills where, where you seek them. Thank you. Great fun. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you uh, for watching. I hope it has been as exciting for you as it was for us. Just talking about it, living vicariously dangerous times here on Roundtable. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, goodbye for now. See you next time. Bye-bye.